Okay, looks like we have almost everyone. Hey, welcome back. Um, so this is the second day of the virtual school, and um, I hope everyone had a good night of rest. This is going to be a long day. Okay, uh, you know, we had half a day last yesterday, and today we have a full day. In the morning, we're going to talk about threats, and we're going to talk about the special memories. And uh, you know, with these two, you will have all the ingredients that you need. And after that, everything else is going to be essentially computational thinking and crafting algorithms and so on. So you're going to see um, you know, performance tuning and floating point considerations tomorrow and application, you know, how to craft applications on, on Thursday. A uh, couple of things. Uh, one is um, you know, the SCSA uh, webmaster is actually still trying to get the slides up. So for the remote people, um, if you're really desperate for the slides, um, you know, contact uh, Shalom on the uh, web uh, board, and he has the slides. So you know, uh, we don't know how to send slides to 150 people real quick, but you know, if you're desperate, we can probably send it to 10 people real quick. Okay, so you know, uh, we should be able to uh, cover your urgent needs. And uh, the other one is, uh, you know, uh, this afternoon we're going to have a hands-on section and, uh, session, and it's going to be a very important part of this, uh, this course. And um, you know, uh, at the beginning, we're going to have one of the TAs to briefly go over you know, uh, the, the files and the, uh, the assignments and so on, and you, uh, there are quite a few things that you're going to have to go through, and, but it's going to be worthwhile. You know, uh, a lot of the concepts are not going to come together until you actually crafted that piece of code and you know, really gone through every step. And um, there are sample solutions, but we really encourage you to craft your own solution before you, you know, look at a sample solution. But um, it's available every step of the way so that you don't have to be stuck and lost and so on since we have a very limited amount of time. Um, for a full semester course, we really don't give you the sample solution until you're done. Right? But uh, you know, for a uh, one-week course, you know, we, we know it's going to be very limited and it's going to be only a couple hours every day. So we want to make sure you can move along. That's why we're going to you know, make a sample solution available to you to make sure you're, you can make progress. OK, so uh, we are uh, moving into uh, the, sort of the more technical part of the uh, course. And could the threats? It's really the main vehicle for parallelism. Okay, and you know, um, you know, it's really the, uh, the soul of the, um, the, the programming model. And the threading model in CUDA is actually quite simple. It's probably one of the simplest uh, program uh, threading models that uh, I have seen. And um, you know, it, it, it can be used in a very disciplined way. And if you use it um, you know, in a disciplined way, your program can be very easy to understand, and your program can be you know, uh, fairly efficient um, you know, for data parallelism. So um, we, let's go back to you know, what David um, you know, what I mentioned yesterday about uh, you know, uh, the block IDs and the thread IDs. And uh, remember, all the CUDA threads, you know, when we launch a kernel, we generate a bunch of threads. And these threads are organized into blocks. And each block is organized into a one, two, or three-dimensional um, you know, uh, array of threads. So uh, these, the, these are all conceptual. Okay? So the, the only means to really figure out the organization is the IDs, the thread index, uh, indices. And that's why for uh, blocks, if you look at every thread, and the thread, the kernel code can read two essentially structures. One is the block index, and the other one is thread index. For block index, you would expect to see x and y because it's up to two dimensions. And for you know, a, um, a thread index, you expect to see uh, thread index.x, thread index.y, and thread index.z. In the future, it's totally possible that the block index can also be uh, extended into three dimensions. So you know, don't assume that it's always going to stay as two dimensions. And um, so the whole thing is really based on these indices. Okay? And every thread, when they read uh, these built-in variables or intrinsic variables, they will figure out which coordinate. Itself, uh, it, it is occupying in that whole space. Okay? So as, so as long as you know exactly how to deal with block IDs and thread IDs, you know, you're going to be very proficient in, uh, you know, in um, uh, manipulating these threads. So uh, you know, uh, we talked about matrix multiplication in the second lecture, and we talked about using only one thread block to you know, do the matrix multiplication. And um, the reason why it, it uses only one block is because the code only uses block IDs, uh, no, uh, rather thread IDs. So whenever there's, you know, you, the code only uses thread ID, there's no way to distinguish between the blocks. So all the threads essentially fall into one block. However, you know, uh, we also talked about the fact that the blocks are of limited size. The reason why blocks are of limited size is because, you know, uh, uh, what, uh, what David mentioned yesterday, we can actually have very efficient collaboration across threads in the block. So threads can synchronize with each other, threads can share data with each other in a very efficient way when they're within the same block. And by definition, you can't have a very, very big block. You know, when there are too many threads, it's hard to make them collaborate efficiently and synchronize efficiently with each other. In the current CUDA standard, uh, the uh, blocks can be of up to one, uh, 512, 512 threads. So you know, if we have a matrix that is of more than 512 um, uh, elements, then we will need to use more than uh, one block in order to do the matrix publication. I saw a question. Yes. Oh yeah, that's so you will be launching two different kernels. Yes, so you would set the, the, the grid dim and uh, you know, uh, dim, and, uh, dim grid and dim, uh, uh, black dim variables in the second launch to you know, 120 and so on. Yes, very good. And um, so what we would, uh, what we would do with the uh, matrix multiplication using multiple blocks is essentially to you know uh, to make to break down the uh, p the product matrix into tiles. And it tile, you know, tiling algorithms are just like physical tiles. If you look at the physical walls with tiles, these are small pieces of you know uh, um, covers, uh, wall covers that cover the entire wall, right? So um, you know, as long as we make each piece small enough to fit into a block, we can have a lot of them to cover the entire uh, product space. So, um, you know, so you will see that these tiles must be um, of uh, 16 or less, because 16 times 16 is 256. For square matrix, this is the largest dimension that you can have um, you know, in terms of the block size. So let's give a very small example. And uh, this is actually the beginning of um, a little bit trickier concept. So you know, I, I'm, going, I'm going to go through this a little bit slower to make sure that uh, all of you are going to you know, be able to deal with not only the tiling of the output, but also the tiling of the input matrices. And things will get a little bit trickier as we move uh, on in the day. So for the, uh, for the simple example, we have a uh, you know, 4 by 4 P uh, uh, matrix multiplication. And we can break it down into um, you know, 2 by 2 tiles. 
And um, each tile will be processed by one block. So we will have block 0, 0 to, uh, you know, to, to process the upper left corner, and block 1, 0 to process the upper right corner, and so on. So this is just a small enough example for you to physically see how the block IDs will be, you know, will be assigned to correspond these threads to the part of the data structure that they're supposed to process. Once you are in one of these tiles, then the thread ID will pick the, uh, the P element that it will be uh, generating. So again, the uh, block IDs and uh, uh, the thread IDs completely determine the part of the data structure that um, the threads are uh, processing. So for this uh, simple example, um, if we go to the, uh, the upper left corner, which is processed by block 0, 0, um, you know, each element is going to be produced by a uh, dot product. So we, uh, we color-coded the input uh, matrices so that you will see that you know, in this particular block, the yellow row in M is going to be used twice, uh, once to produce uh, you know, P00 and the other one to produce uh, P, uh, you know, P10. Okay? So uh, you know, it, this is something to, to kind of keep in mind, because if you look at this particular you know, this tile, every input element is actually used twice. Okay, used twice. Once, you know, once to produce you know, um, each of the two uh, elements in a row or, in, uh, or uh, each of the elements in a column, depending on whether it's M or N. Okay, so this is something uh, useful to keep in mind for later on. So you know what? the fundamental algorithm is not going to be very, very different. There's going to be just a little bit um, more sophisticated use of the, uh, the uh, indices in order to determine the output that will be used. So um, you know what? if we go back to the, uh, to, uh, to, to the uh, first picture, uh, we're going to, uh, in slide three, we're going to see that you know what? for every element, we're going to actually process a row of N and a column of N. And the row of M is now determined not just by the thread ID, but also by the block ID. So the block ID is going to hop over one tile height at a time down into the row, right, into the row of M. And also the block ID will hop over one, you know, one section of the width in N until you hit the column. So to calculate which row you're going to be processing with M, you're going to actually have your block ID times the tile width, right? And plus, you know, whatever thread ID you have within the, the, the tile that you're in. Right? You need to hop over so many tiles, and then you need to index into the tile that you're in. Right? So you will expect to see that, uh, that code where you will see for the row index, you're going to have block ID times, uh, times the tile width plus your uh, thread index of your y index. And the other one is the column, and you will use the, uh, the x coordinate. So these two essentially give you the exact row index and the exact column index. Okay? Now, once you get into, once you find out the row index and column index, you can go into the, uh, the, um, the, the dot product again. And the dot product is going to be very similar to what you had before, except that what used to be the thread ID now needs to be the row, and what used to be the thread ID here needs to be the column. And then you will be able to actually walk down the correct row and column of the N and N using K to advance in your dot product, just like before. And now you can uh, do the dot product. Yes? Where's tile width declared? Oh, uh, the tile width would be declared in a dot uh, H file somewhere. And okay. yeah, so you know what? In, uh, this is actually one of the, uh, one of the things that, uh, that you, would, uh, you would need to be able to uh, use as a tuning parameter. So oftentimes it's declared in a dot H file, but um, you, know what? You, you may need to change that you know, declaration when you type to the program. Okay. So um, you know what? After the dot product, you will come out and write the p-value into the, uh, the, the product matrix. And again, the, you, know, you, you do know the row ID and the, uh, the row index and the column index, so um, you can easily generate the proper you know, uh, final address into that uh, product. So this is not a huge, you know, huge step beyond what we had in the, you know, in, uh, using one block only. But um, it is important that you understand the block ID and the thread ID and understand the conceptual you know, thinking when you, you're conceptually breaking down the output array or output matrix into these tiles. And you're using the block ID as a means to hop over the tiles that you're not processing until you get into your own tile. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, uh, David, let me take real quick, and I'll, I'll let you have the final say. How's that? So, um, you know, uh, it, it is ideal. That's you know, that's what what it, uh, you know, put it this way. What you're asking uh, the question is, why do you have a limited number of uh, threads in a block rather than have a virtualized, right? You know, a limited number of uh, threads in a block, and then let the runtime hardware or software to break it down into the appropriate organization. You know, uh, uh, which is ideal, by the way. You know, I, I love that. And uh, but you know, in reality, that will require a lot of sophistication in the runtime. In particular, you know, if you are, you know, if the hardware is fundamentally a two-level hierarchy, you will need to have a, you know, a mapping of algorithms from a virtualized one level to these two levels. But it could be done. You know, uh, I'm sorry. Through <coughs> so the translation, through so some kind of translation compiler or something, right? Yeah, standard. Yeah. Um, maybe if you want to look at it, you want to figure out it. Yes. Yeah. So you know, the question is, why, why don't you just you know, use some kind of a, you know, a high-level compiler transformation to, you know, to, to do it? In fact, uh, that, you know, what you said is my job security. So you know, I, I, I'm a fundamentally a compiler person. So you know, I actually build parallelizing compilers and so on. And the kind, of, you know, the kind of transformations that you need in order to do a reliable implementation of that is actually quite, quite big. So you know, this goes back to what David was saying yesterday. You know what? Um, this is a, a product, so they need to, you know, they need to support these products in a, you know, in a real product way, and you have you know, thousands of people using the product. So they need to be very careful at, at every stage of the product in picking, you know, in picking the, the, the right interfaces and support them with the, the, the kind of technology that they can actually craft into a solid way. And you know, I, I don't want to speak for David in terms of the company, you know, their, their product strategies. But from my perspective, you know, five years from now, if some of the things that really mature, if I do my job right as a researcher, they may even go into that kind of model. Okay. David, do you, you know, do you have? Uh, I, don't, I don't have a lot, lot to add to that. I was going to just give a short answer and say, you know, that's a great idea. It sounds like a great research project. <laughs> <laughs> it is still a research stage. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so, but also what I said is right is, is that um, you know, our goal is to keep the, the technology as simple as possible because each layer of complexity we add uh, makes the, the runtime layer thicker 
and makes more code that we have to maintain, and it's a feature then that we have to maintain on an ongoing basis. So uh, we're, we're, we need to be very thoughtful about uh, how we evolve the programming model. But it's, it's also true that uh, over time, I think simplification will be the way that we will evolve. We'll figure out more ways to have the, the tools and the hardware do things for you so you don't have to be so thoughtful about it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yes, sir. Um, so the question is, as we take you know, CUDA into these other models, such as multi-core, you know, do, do we find the uh, threading model to be good or you know, like a hindrance or, or what? Um, the answer is, actually, this threading model is not bad. Um, you know, uh, it goes down to the fundamental um, hardware organization. It turns out that you know, even though the CUDA you know, uh, hardware appears to be very different from, let's say, multi-core hardware, but fundamentally, you need to have locality to work for any of these hardware. So um, you know, I'm going to actually spend a little bit of time tomorrow uh, to talk about the NCUDA you know, uh, considerations. But uh, what we ended up doing is we take, we're taking an entire block of threads and translate them into a single CPU thread. Okay, and but the kind of the reason why it works well is because conceptually these you know, of these tiling kind of um, you know transformations that the CUDA program is already doing. So these blocks that got translated into single thread tend to have extremely good locality. Okay, and they also get optimized very well by the host compiler for SSE kind of things. You know, for those of you who are not familiar with the term, don't worry about it. But you know, the host compilers for these you know essentially you know vector nodes in the CPUs tend to do very very well with the code that we, we generate. So that's one thing that we learned. In many ways, this is just one vehicle for you to you know to think and to craft your code in a localized way, in a hierarchical uh, you know uh, localized way, and then it gets translated into these other models you know, you know fairly efficiently. Ah, okay, so the question is, um, you know, can, can you just write a simple matrix multiplication you know, uh, um, you know, with a big matrix? And then uh, you know, the, the compiler software and the runtime software will chop it up into these you know, pieces. Um, you know, it, again, it's actually fundamentally the same question as, you know, uh, you know, uh, is this a key? Yeah. Kiriakis. Uh, you know, Kiriakis was asking. Because uh, you know, what, that, what that entails is to have some kind of compiler software or runtime software to actually break down these threads into these tiles. And then transform some of these memory you know, addresses so that you can use the real hardware IDs to, you know, to, to do the addressing. So all those transformations are fundamentally the same thing. And in fact, some of my students in my group do that kind of research. It's, just like it's not mature enough to, to become a mass market product yet. But you know, sooner or later. Yes? Yes. So the question is, uh, there's a limited amount of memory in the uh, GPU card. And if, um, you know, in the old generation, it's 760 megabytes. But uh, in the newer generation, it's up to 4 gig. And beyond 4 gig, you will need to have more than 32 bit of addresses, because 32 bits gives you 4 gig you know, addresses. So um, you know, it, these things, you know, the, the fundamental question is, when there's a limited amount of you know, uh, DRAM or memory on that GPU card, you will need to figure out how to fit your data into the GPU memory, not just necessarily in the thread and so on, which is absolutely true. And um, you know, in, in most of the applications, we do need to make sure that the input data gets broken down into you know, chunks that, that will fit into. And tiling is, is indeed, you know, you'll have multiple, essentially, that's the reason why you'll have hierarchical tiling. That you know, you, you know, if you have a let's say a really big matrix that will be you know more than 40. So what you will need to do is you will need to break it down into you know fundamentally another layer of tiles, and then you will do the tile swapping and so on in order to, to, to do the matrix multiplication. Now the API does not have that kind of uh, you know uh, control, and it's actually equivalent to what CPU people have been doing for years. You know, uh, the, the real the real issue is in the CPU when you exceed the, uh, the physical memory space, you're also doomed. So most of the people who deal with these very large matrices in the CPU space also have been doing these you know uh, blocking kind of thing anyway. So those are you know conceptually they're equivalent. Okay, um, so you know uh, let, so let's using that example, let's go uh, go back into some of these uh, more kind of uh, sophisticated uh, you know uh, threading models. So uh, you know uh, again you know it's very important to remember when you launch the kernel, all the threads. That uh, gets generated by that launch, which is called a grid, okay, a grid of threads. That all the threads in that grid will be executing the same program. Okay, they will be executing the same function. And um, so the block size is anywhere from one to five twelve. And the block shapes could be you know one D, two D, and three D. And uh, you know the blocks are organized into one D or two D. And the threads are, you know will have thread ID numbers within the block, and the thread program uses thread ID to select the working area within the data. Okay, so you know I'm repeating some of these things, but you know you will appreciate it later on when we go into more difficult concepts. And threads are in the same block can share data and synchronize very efficiently. Okay, and you know we're actually going to go over uh, some of that. And the threads in different blocks cannot co cooperate. And this is essentially the secret sauce of you know, uh, seamless scaling of uh, you know, binary code. So this is what we call the transparent scalability. The hardware is, you know, because the threads cannot op cooperate across blocks, then the timing of executing one block versus the other is completely arbitrary. Okay, there's no interaction, there's no constraint. Yes, Craig? Ah, um, you know what, I think you should, you know what, fundamentally you should assume that they can happen in arbitrary order. Yeah. And in assume. the current generation, <laughs> but, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't that be what you would advise? It is possible that they will execute in order. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> If you want to assume it, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, one, one thing is, uh, in, in, a, in a very real case, you can, um, you can cause it to execute out of, out of order in, in some funny ways by creating blocks that have vastly different run times. Mm -hmm. right. So they'll, they'll complete it. Yeah, right. That's right. Yeah. Put it this way. Um, you know, there's probably not any guarantee in the hardware to put it back in order if they go out of order. Right. So you shouldn't assume that. 
Good. Okay. So uh, you know, so but this is what David was alluding to yesterday. You know, because of this arbitrary order, right? You can you have a lot of flexibility in hardware design to execute these blocks in very different rates. You can you know build a very very cheap, very low cost piece of hardware that may actually only execute one block at a time. Right? And you can build a very elaborate, very wide hardware that can execute you know, something like 100 blocks at a time. So this is how you can you know, what, execute the same exact program, same binary program, but at very, very different rates, at different power consumption constraints and so on. So you could have your own simulation program you know, what, run, that run on your cell phone in the future, but it will run very slowly. Right? But you, know, you can move that, into the, in, in, that same binary into the desktop and run very fast, or even uh, move into a, a cluster that will run even faster. So um, you know, how are these things executed? And um, now we're talking about something that is in the implementation level. Okay, so I always want to make sure that everyone understands what is in the language you know, what's in the language, what's in the um, you know, in the programming interface that you can depend on. But then when you get into the performance tuning of each generation of hardware, you will need to understand a little bit more about hardware behavior. But keep in mind, your program cannot depend on this behavior for correctness. Always be very careful not to assume these things, you know, for correctness reasons. So you know, now we're getting into the design of a generation of hardware and the, this behavior. So we're using the G80 example, but uh, you know, I would imagine for even for G200, the uh, behavior at this level is not going to be that different. Uh, David, correct me if I'm wrong. Right. Okay. So um, you know, remember, in, um, David showed an uh, architecture diagram where you know, there are 128 of those little green processors called streaming processors in that big diagram. And every eight of those little processors is organized into what we call the streaming multiprocessors. This is perhaps the most important hardware jargon that you're going to be dealing with for the rest of the course. A streaming multiprocessor is half of that picture, um, you know, in this, uh, half of the picture in the slide. And this streaming multiprocessor has eight you know, little processors in there. And there's also a shared memory uh, in the processor that they can use to exchange data very efficiently. There's a way to synchronize the execution of you know, all, all the processors you know, effectively. And um, there's also a, only a single instruction fetch unit for all the eight processors. So at every clock cycle, all the processors will be seeing the same instruction. But there's some subtlety in there that is not what you would think as the uh, SIMD model for those of you who are familiar with it. So I'm actually going to have to talk about this in a little more detail. That's why it's called SIMT. And um, you know what, we, uh, we, I will come back to that point very soon. So um, the threads are assigned into these streaming multiprocessors here on a block by block basis. Okay. So when you launch that kernel, when you, when you fix the dimensions of your blocks, and you fix the number of blocks, and you launch that kernel, all these threads are going to be organized on a block by block basis. Anything that happens to these threads will happen to the entire block. So these are your comrades. Okay? They're, they're going to be all be traveling together you know, in their journey. Right? And so um, you, know what? They're up to, uh, they're, you can assign up to eight blocks to every streaming multiprocessor. So in the matrix multiplication example, let's say if we use a you know, two by two block, it's a very small block, okay? but um, you know what? You can, uh, each block will have four threads. Right? And you can assign up to eight blocks into each SM. So that each SM can accommodate, in that particular example, 32 threads, up to 32 threads. Right? And if you have, let's say, 16 by 16 uh, blocks, then each block will have 256 threads, right? And you can have up to eight blocks. So theoretically, you could have eight times 256 according to what I just said, but there's another level of constraint. You cannot have more than 768 threads that reside in this uh, streaming multiprocessor. So at that point, the eight block is more than 768, so you'll cut off at 768. So you will end up with only three blocks in the streaming multiprocessor if you have 16 by 16 blocks. So these, all these hardware constraints, you know, they're not that complicated if you think about them this way. They all have certain level of you know, limitation, but whichever you hit first will become the real limitation. So this is called bottleneck, right? It's the, it's the bottleneck that eventually limits your, your, your performance. And so that's the second bullet here. Every SM can take up to 768 threads, and it could be 256 times 3. It could be 128 times 6. Can it be 64 times 12? Why? Because you hit that 8 limit. You got it. Exactly. So whichever you hit first will become the cutoff. Make sense? Okay, so um, you know what? the threads can run concurrently. And you know what? essentially, SM maintains the thread, thread and block ID for all the blocks, all the threads that are residing in the SM. That's why you know, someone asked this question. You know what? Within the block, are all the threads be guaranteed to run at the same time? And the answer is yes, because the hardware truly maintains enough resources to be able to, keep, to make progress on all the threads in a block once the block goes into the SM. That's the reason why there's a limitation of how many threads you can send into an SM, because they need to make sure they have enough resources for everyone to make progress once they get into the SM. Okay? And um, so SM also manages a schedule this thread execution. So what I'm showing here is, you know, there are three blocks assigned to SM0 and three blocks assigned to SM1. Okay? Now, let's kind of go a little bit deeper into this thing little, um, in terms of scheduling. So um, you know, let's say well, I'm, I'm blowing up the, uh, the streaming multiprocessor here a little bit. And the streaming multiprocessor will have an instruction fetch unit, and you know, it will have shared memory, it has, you know, it'll have all these little processors. And there's a, you know, a, spe a special function unit, SFU, and these things are actually you know, used to calculate trigonometry functions and so on. And these things are very useful if you are doing things like medical imaging and so on, where you use sine and cosine kind of things often. And you know, for example, in the MRI case, we actually speeded up the whole thing by about three times by just using the sine and cosine implementation you know, in, the, in the special hardware. So if your application uses sine and cosine and you know, square root kind of things a lot, these things uh, can help you very much. And um, you know, but they, if you look at it, there are only two of them rather than eight of them in the SM. That means that the throughput will be a little lower. People need to wait, wait around a little bit to, to use the two rather than the eight. Okay? And you know, so David is probably going to, uh, actually, uh, it may be later uh, uh, tomorrow where we're going to be talking about some of these considerations. Okay, so let's look at the blocks that get assigned. That get assigned into the SM. So I, you know, we're showing that three blocks, one in green, one in uh, brown, and one in, uh, one in orange, and one in uh, blue. Oh, that orange is terrible. That orange is Texas color. <laughs> it's not Illinois orange. It really shows or Illinois orange here. Um, okay, so you know, I'm making trouble with that. Um, so each block is executed you know, as 32 thread warps. So what does that mean? 
when you have a block that is of you know, 32 threads or more, it's further divided, uh, divided into warps. So the division is actually quite predictable. The first 32 goes into the first warp. The second 32 goes to the second warp. So block, uh, thread ID 0 to 31 goes into the first. And then you know, thread ID 32 to 63 goes to the second. Okay? So you know, that's what we're showing here. Thread 0 to 31 and so, uh, will be the first warp. And this is an implementation decision. You cannot count down this in terms of correctness. Don't make this kind of assumption in your code. And you know, later on, you, you can uh, break. And the warps are scheduled as units in the SEM. Okay? So the real scheduling unit is warps. Whenever you know, uh, the hardware, the real hardware execution, those processors are actually used on warps. Okay? So um, let's say if I have 256 threads, then you know, uh, I would divide each block of uh, you know, 265, uh, 56, uh, 256 thread block uh, into 32. So that gives you eight warps right, per, um, uh, per block. So these eight warps will be scheduled on an individual basis. They, at any time in the real hardware execution, you, know, you could have one warp that is making progress and the other warps are temporarily suspended from the hardware execution. And whenever they're ready, they will come in. So in this example, when we have, let's say, 256 threads, we'll have eight from green, eight from uh, orange, and eight from blue. So that will give us 24 of those warps. You know, that we can make progress, at, try to make progress at any time. And so you, you should imagine that the, the 24 warps will be sitting around, just like here. And at every time, I would just point to one of them, and one can speak. And then you will point to another one, another one can speak. So they will make progress this way. But the resources are allocated enough in the, that you will all have seats in this room. And you will all be able to eventually speak. Okay? You will be able to make progress. Okay? So that's how the, scheduling, you know, how, how the basic scheduling you know, uh, mechanisms are organized. And warps are really performance considerations. And if you don't care about performance, you really don't need to know about warps in order to get your program to work. Okay? But as soon as you start to, to, to care about performance, you do need to understand a little bit more about warps. And the warps are not really difficult. Warps are just the every the groups of 32 threads okay, in the current generation of hardware um, that you break up in, uh, from the uh, blocks. So how does it actually you know, uh, work, uh, how does it actually work in, the, uh, in, in the hardware implementation? The, these streaming multiprocessors implement what we call the zero overhead warp scheduling. And what that means is that at any time, even though only one of the warps can execute in the processors, but as soon as the, cur as soon as the, the current warp hits a roadblock, let's say the next instruction of the warp requires a piece of memory data that can take days, according to, you know, to yesterday's lecture, right? You know, the, the memory data may take you know, a long, long time to come back, right? As soon as you hit that instruction, the instruction still is waiting for a piece of data. This warp gets pushed into a waiting area. And another warp that has all, all its instruction data ready will come in. And this switching does not take any extra clock cycle. Okay, this switching is done on an instant basis. So that's called zero uh, overhead scheduling. Yes? So there's some limit factors in the overhead uh, Running meaning around. Right? Yeah. So that's the 24. Uh, the, the, right. So you know, it's the 760. You, you, you can calculate it in many ways, but essentially you, you'll come down to you know, uh, essentially 24. Yeah. 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 And you know, uh, David, any, <laughs> any addition? Yeah. But again, you know, that, that's just the capacity of the current generation hardware. Okay. So um, you know, uh, um, all the threads in the world will execute the same instruction when they're selected. So you know, it appears to be a, a, you know, a very constraining you know, situation, but it turns out that for correctness, you don't actually need to obey this. You, just, you pay some performance penalty when you don't obey this particular uh, you know, constraint. So let me, let's do a little bit of exercise here, okay? just to make sure that everyone are on the same page uh, before we move forward. For matrix multiplication using multiple blocks, should I use 8 by 8, 16 by 16, or 32 by 32? Okay, so you know, with all the information I have given you, you should be able to answer this question. And in fact, this question was one of the midterm questions that you know, we're using as a master course. Right? So you know, uh, that's another thing. You know, when we do the summer, you know, summer is always a more relaxing time. So you know, there's no exam in the summer school. Isn't that wonderful? You know, uh, I, I, used to, you know, I used to think that you know, all the semester course should be also like this. You know, uh, why exams? Um, you know, students sweat. Professors have to grade. You know. um, so you know, for 8 by 8, we have 64 threads. Right? 8 by 8, every block is 64 threads. Right? And so you know, since each SM can take up to 768 threads, you know, uh, in order to really fill up the thread capacity, we should have 12 blocks. But the hardware can only take eight blocks. So this means that we're going to have some underutilization of threat capacity in the, in the SN. So 8 by 8 is not exactly the best, you know, the, the best trade-off. In fact, you end up with only 512 threads. Right? The 8 times the 64, that gives you the 512. So you're underutilizing the SN threading capacity by one third. And this is actually an important thing to remember because when you, you, know, when you lose threads, when things get cut off, it's cut off on a block by block basis. It's not that, oh, I don't have enough seat. I, I just you know, I take one student out of the room. It's like I take one row of students out of the room every time. So every time something bad happens, I lose an entire group. Right? So that's why you know, when we do the eight by eight, you know, when I hit that eight block limitation, I actually end up losing one third of my capacity just off the top. Okay? So the, if I use 16 by 16, we have 256 threads per block. And since each SM can take up to 768 blocks, it can up, take up to three blocks. And even though it's not take, take getting all the eight blocks that you could accommodate, but you already reached the, the threading capacity. That is, you know, we already had all the 768 threads in, that, in, in this SM. So we're already fully utilizing the resource. So this is a good choice. Now you can get a little bit greedy and say, okay, how about 332 by 32? You know, you know, that would be even better. Well, now we have 1,024 threads per block, and not even one can fit into the SM. So depending on the, 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 um, the, the runtime that you have, you know, I believe in some of the runtimes, you will not be able to run the application you know, with 32 by 32 block. In some cases, you may be able to run it, but you better check the result because the result is probably not going to be correct. Yes? I 
Yes, so the question is, you know, uh, you know when, when someone spends all this time, you know, figuring this out and, you know, uh, figure out the block size and all that, and, you know, for the current generation of hardware, if the next generation of hardware suddenly, you know, ra raises the, um, you know, these limitations to the uh, next level, uh, a lot of the tuning or optimization you do are no longer optimal. So, you know what, do I have to spend all my time, you know, retuning my program, you know, maybe spend a lot of time you know, doing that again? So, you know what, I, I would let David talk about the product considerations, but, you know what, this is exactly the reason why, you know, we did what we call the CUDA tune, um, you know, the framework. Essentially, what we want people to do is not to program these things based on hardwired block size numbers, but we want people to be able to program these things in terms of parameterized. You know what, essentially, you say, here is, you know what, here is a parameter called block size, and all my algorithm is, you know what, based on this parameter. And then we have a search engine to actually search for the optimal, you know what, um, like parameter values for you and for each generation of the hardware. And we just published that paper not too long ago, and it will take a while to work in the products, but, you know what, it, it is a technology that we do want to push towards be precisely because of the reason you mentioned. David. So that's a great answer. Another, uh, hopefully you'll feel it's a great answer, is that uh, GPUs get faster at a pretty alarming rate. So when you um, develop your, your code for today's GPU, we expect that we'll build one in about a year that's about twice as fast. So no matter what choices you make, it's really rare that your program will get slower, even if we change the number of threads or the number of blocks or whatever, if the overall machine is twice as fast. And in fact, we don't leave that to chance. What we do is all of the applications that we know about, we test on the architectural model of a, of a new machine, and we make sure we don't have performance regressions. That's another reason for you to, if you have some interesting piece of code, submit it to CUDAZone so that we will make it available to other people, but also uh, we'll use it for our own testing and we'll make sure it, it gets faster. Well, you wouldn't. It's likely you won't get just 10%. And I'll talk about um, I'll talk about this in my keynote this afternoon. But uh, we we um, pretty routinely get approximately double the performance on upwards of 90% of the applications that we know about without any retuning. Yeah. So and, and all the changes that we make, you know, for example, we're not going to make a change where fewer blocks run or fewer threads per block because then that'll break all the code. So the changes we make will only be upwardly compatible kind of changes. Yeah. So you know, what David is saying, you know, if you look at G80 and G200, okay, so these are two chip generations, and there are more SMs in the uh, in, in the G200. So that's where you know this more than twice the performance kind of thing would, would kick in. But um, you know, conceivably, you could have a generation where you can take more blocks into an SM. But you know, what David is saying is, you may have some incentive to retune your program to get even more performance, but that chip, well, you know, even without tuning, that chip will have more SMs, and you know, chances are you will have more performance anyway. Right. One other way to look, about, look at this is, um, is the other 99% of our business is the, the PC graphics usage of the chips. And if you look at you know, the world of, of uh, gaming, for example, there are thousands of games out there, and all the people who, who have a PC and they play a game and they buy a new graphics card, they're not going to retune and recompile their games that they play. They're just going to plug in the graphics card, and darn it, it better get faster. So that's, that's, how, we measure, <laughs> that's how we measure our success and how our customers measure it. So we have to do the same thing for, for uh, other computing as well. It's perfect. Yeah, I know. Just a question on the boosters and the CG or specific hardware types so that on, on cluster computers we have different graphics cards on different nodes. You can compile and automatically choose these sorts of things. Is there going to be an uh, addition to CUDA that will allow for something like this where on this note my block size is 20 so the question uh, for the for remote people is, uh, in previous generation programming environment, uh, CG for graphics, there were profiles so that you could target the configuration of your program to different uh, kinds of hardware configurations. And will CUDA have, have that? Uh, it's possible, but I expect that uh, we've, we've, uh, we've learned from our, our previous experiences, and we want to try to make the, those uh, sort of things easier to use. And hopefully, uh, if, if there could be a profile, we also ought to be able to figure it out with the toolchain. So it's the reason for this built-in scalability. We, we didn't design CG to have built-in scalability. CUDA, we had the chance to think about all of this in advance. So, so uh, it's, uh, again, uh, it's certainly possible, and if we need it, we'll, we'll do it. But we're hoping to, to get away without having to have people do that. We'll get to that. Yeah, so we'll get to that. But I can give a quick answer. That, um, that's actually the way. So the question is, um, you know, threads as a group in a warp uh, will fetch an instruction and execute it. What if they don't all want to execute that instruction? And the answer is that's how we handle divergence. We have an execution mask, and we can separate out a warp so that only some of the threads in a warp will, will execute in a given cycle. And uh, just as, as Wendy was talking about this and the other questions were being asked, I thought of the, a good analogy for, for warps and, and blocks is you can look at, uh, you know, this, uh, this classroom is a block of threads. Each of you is a thread. And each row is, is a warp. And, uh, you know, let's say you, you all want to talk at once, but you can't. Uh, but we'll, we'll organize it so we'll talk a row at a time. And each of you can say one word and we'll cycle through the rows. Uh, <coughs> and, and that's. <laughs> Maybe not intelligible, <laughs> but but it's efficient. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so so, um, so warp. Um, although we talk about uh, so the question is is uh, warps don't have IDs, uh, but blocks and threads do. Uh, actually, um, warps are an implementation detail, and uh, they we, we go through the, the trouble of explaining warps to you, so you get a little insight into how instructions get consumed as you think about. Um, organizing your program, but uh, the warps are probably the most tenuous piece of the architecture. Warps may be a different size, they may be non-existent, they may be, have different amounts of resources next time. Uh, they, may, they may totally change, and, and they're, not, um, they're not architecturally visible. So from the point of view of the language and the program, you don't have to know about warps. That's, that's right. And, and you know, for the hardware, the warps do have IDs, but we don't expose them to the, to the programming environment. Because that, that's guaranteed to change. So there was another question in the middle, but it got, got uh, consumed. <laughs> So it's perfect timing for me to stand up and talk because we're going to do the transition here anyway. And uh, we'll talk more about um, some of the API features in, in detail. Uh, so uh, 
uh, we've uh, said this a bunch of times to make sure that, that it, it gets through. Really, we're, we're uh, designing this programming environment to be a pure extension to the C programming language. So uh, built, built entirely on top of, of NCC. And so um, there are, there are language, uh, a couple of components to that. One is language extensions. And really, the main places we had to make extensions were in the area of control of execution and control of location of, of data and programs. And uh, in addition, we had to build a runtime library, which uh, provides all the services that you need to be able to, to have effective programs. So, uh, so there is uh, a common component that uh, exists both on the host and the device uh, to provide the foundation for the programs that you want to write, which has things like uh, built-in vector types and uh, C runtime implementations that, that uh, mirror each other. Uh, there's the host components uh, that are used for uh, controlling and managing the device from the host side, and then the device component, which has the, the functions that, that logically only need to exist uh, on the device, things that you're going to be doing uh, with the parallelism. So uh, on the language extension side, uh, there are a number of built-in variables just for uh, convenience. These wouldn't uh, have to be there, but they're um, the things that, that uh, we, we provide for you. Uh, the the uh, grid dimension is, is the uh, dimension of, of uh, how many blocks you have in each dimension. And we use the same 3D type that we use for the block dimension of how many threads there are within a block. Even though the, the grid is only 2D currently, we do reserve the space uh, uh, for the future uh, with the expectation that we may extend the grids to be 3D at some point. Uh, it is, there's a certain symmetry there, and, and, uh, and we have had a lot of requests. In fact, uh, several of you yesterday asked for four dimensions. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so you, know, it's, you know, it just goes to show it's never enough. Whatever you give people, they want more. Uh, so, uh, but it, it certainly makes sense. I think that for the same reasons that 2D and 3D grids make sense with um, and block um, makes sense with uh, certain kinds of data type. If you have volume data that changes over time, that's, that's a four-dimensional structure. So that, that's, uh, that's not, uh, I won't rule that out at some point in the future. Uh, in addition, um, the, the block index and uh, the thread index, and again, uh, we use a three-dimensional type even though the, the array of blocks is only uh, two-dimensional. And um, both of these are, are um, structures that you can access with X, Y, and Z, and you can also access them as an array. Uh, in the, uh, the, the runtime component, uh, this is common to both uh, uh, the, the host and the device, we support a bunch of uh, common mathematical functions. And uh, these are, are only scalar functions, uh, but you can easily uh, build vector functions out of them. On the, uh, on the CPU, on the host, we use the uh, standard C runtime uh, if it's available on the platform. Uh, and on the, um, the GPU hardware on the device, uh, we have built-in hardware for many of these functions. And so uh, most of them actually uh, just, just make a hardware call to, uh, to, the, uh, to the special function unit uh, inside the SM. Uh, there's also the opportunity. Oh, I have a question there. Um, So the question is, is there a documentation of which ones of these are well pipeline and which ones are taking a long time and, and break all the pipeline? Uh, so first, the answer is yes. In the programming guide, there's a description of which things are, are costly and how costly they are. The second answer is that uh, you know, 30 cycles, latency is nothing, because all the latency is getting, getting hidden by the rest of you threads. So, so, uh, so latency is not a problem. Throughput is, is the only quantity that is limited. If you think about having uh, 768 threads running in an SM, uh, what's 32 cycles? It's nothing. So, uh, but here's a specific example of, of the ones that are particularly fast. And um, most of these um, uh, operations, the hardware implementation, uh, provides an estimate that's good to on the order of 23 or 24 bits, so very close to full single precision floating point. And this is, again, uh, it's, a, it's a, a boon, a bounty that you get from the graphics heritage of the GPU. These are functions that we need to run at lightning speed for, for graphics functions, so you get them for free in, in other kinds of computing. If you um, use these forms with the, the double underscore, you get the intrinsic single cycle hardware functions. And uh, they're not quite full floating point precision, but, but often your, your data is not either. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so you don't lose anything more by, by doing that, and you, and you can get unbelievable speeds. And in fact, some of the, um, some of the simulations uh, that are doing a, a lot of uh, trigonometric functions uh, in, the, in the financial community, this is where we get thousands of times faster than CPUs because there are not these kind of functions in, in CPUs. Sure. Yeah, so, so the, the comment uh, was uh, there's also um, uh, intrinsic versions of the multiplication and the other, other floating point operations that, that just do 24-bit, particularly for integers, because the, in, the, uh, in the G80, the GeForce uh, 8000 series, um, the, the ALU is 24-bit to support the, the single precision floating point. And when you do integer, if you do a full 32-bit integer operation, it requires multiple cycles because you have to build it out of 24-bit pieces. So if you use the intrinsic underscore multiply for, for integer multiply, you get a 24-bit multiply, which is often enough. So the, uh, <coughs> the runtime component um, provides functions for managing the device. Uh, and this includes multi-device systems. If you have multiple GPUs in your system, you have to explicitly manage the multiple GPUs. Uh, and that's done with uh, the, the device runtime. Uh, for memory management, which we've already spoken about, and something which we haven't spoken about, and all of our examples are, are, uh, are teaching you bad things because we're not checking the error returns for the calls. And uh, it's very important, uh, the, the error handling, uh, once you, you have an error in one of your CUDA calls, uh, all bets are off, and uh, you're, you're, uh, you'll get errors propagating uh, forward. So you should always check the errors uh, and go ahead and uh, go fix them or, or stop if you get an error return. And uh, if, the, uh, if the CUDA uh, functions return no error, then, uh, then uh, you can proceed and you should assume everything is fine. Let's initialize the first time uh, that, that you call a runtime function, and, uh, and once you, you have, have an error, you need to go back and start over again. Uh, the, if you have a machine with multiple CPUs or multiple CPU threads and multiple physical GPU devices and you want to write an application that uses the multiple devices, you have to split your CPU part of your application into multiple host threads and each one controls one of the GPU devices. And uh, then, then you, you run uh, other code to manage all of that data together. Um, part of the reason for this is uh, the way that drivers and uh, hardware are supported in various operating systems that, that a, a device can only be owned by, by one thread <laughs> and also uh, that, that you can't have multiple graphics devices owned by the same thread. Uh, yeah. Sure. 
Uh, I don't know. The question is, does the check error function force a synchronization? I don't know, but uh, oh, John knows. The answer is yes. And uh, this is a good, a good uh, point to mention uh, that uh, it's always safe to over-synchronize. <laughs> it, uh, it may slow you down a little bit. Uh, and in the case um, of the, the hardware synchronization, calling sync threads when you're already synchronized costs nothing. So, so it's, uh, it's harmless, or almost harmless. Another question back there? OK, uh, so the uh, question is, can I talk about the overhead of scheduling CUDA threads and graphics uh, threads at the same time? And do they play uh, nicely? Uh, they, they play very nicely. They take turns with each other. So what happens is when you want to run CUDA and you also want to run a graphics application, uh, you have to um, you end up time slicing on the machine. But we don't interrupt the uh, the CUDA kernel in the middle. We only will will do um, transfers in between kernel execution and granular execution on graphics. On the graphics side, very rarely is the primitive is there a primitive that takes a long time. Uh, if you drew a full screen triangle with a shader that was very very many instructions, you could have a primitive that takes a long time. But people don't usually do that. They, they build the graphics out of a bunch of smaller primitives. So context switching between CUDA and graphics happens between primitives on the graphics side and between kernels on the CUDA side. So if you're aware of that, you can, uh, you can either do the, the switching yourself, you can interleave your execution, or if you keep all of your, uh, your computation in nice bite-sized pieces, it makes it easier for the runtime and the hardware to manage it for you. But there isn't preemptive multitasking on the GPUs, as far as you know. Okay. So, uh, so the other uh, one which we mentioned a couple times is the, the synchronization function on the, on the device. And this is a really super important uh, function for taking advantage of the hardware capabilities of collaborating within a, a block. And uh, it's a simple barrier. It synchronizes all the threads in a block. And so when the first threads reach the barrier, they wait until all the threads uh, have reached that. And uh, so if you're already synchronized and you're already executing in lockstep uh, within the block, uh, it doesn't cost anything to wait until everybody reaches that point, because everybody reaches a point at the same time. Uh, this is uh, very important to avoid uh, hazards with reading and writing and uh, write after write uh, for accessing the shared memory, which is on chip, and also the global memory off chip. If you want to do uh, share information between threads, you have to write it to one of the memories, do a synchronization to make sure that all the threads have done the writing, and then you can proceed and, and read the data after that. And uh, the, the, uh, this is allowed in conditionals only if it's a uniform conditional across the entire thread block. So if the whole block is going to take the same path on the conditional, uh, then, then uh, synchronization is allowed. If you put a sync threads in the middle of a conditional and not all the threads take the same branch, uh, waiting for all the threads to reach that point could be a long wait. On that. Okay, that's the end of the first uh, session. Or, or are we a little bit behind or about on time? Do we take a break now? 15 minutes? Okay, so we'll see you at uh, 10.30.